Hi, this is Peter Taiti and Manos Berlakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute and the Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation presenting case 119 for the Manual of CTO Interventions. This is a case of epicardial perforation. The patient was an older woman with severe lifestyle limiting angina in the setting of a circumflex CTO. She was on several medications and could not be chest pain free. That is why she was referred for PCI of the circumflex CTO. She had multiple previous PCIs in the circumflex, with stents going from the proximal circumflex into this large obtuse marginal branch. However, this was a left dominant system with a distal circumflex CTO with an unclear proximal cap somewhere within the previously placed stent, with the distal vessel filling via epicardial collaterals from the first obtuse marginal branch. There was some disease in the non-dominant right coronary artery with um, the marginal branch supplying a fairly um, epicardial collateral that was uh, fairly tortuous into the distal circumflex and the left posterior descending artery. This is an example of an ambiguous proximal cap and there are different ways one can uh, resolve ambiguity. One is to perform better in geography in various views, although in our particular case it was a blunt stamp that could not help. The other is to do a CT angiogram, which was actually done in this case, but could not help except for showing that this was a long segment of occlusion. Third, to do intravascular ultrasound to localize the proximal cap. Fourth, do subindimal dissection and then enter into the vessel. However, this was not feasible here because of the previously placed stand. And lastly is to do a retrograde approach, trying to recanalize in the retrograde direction. So to summarize, we have a CTO of the circumflex. We do not know where the CTO starts. The length is long, about 50 millimeters. The distal vessel is diffusely diseased and fills via epicardial collaterals from the first obtuse marginal branch, but also through an acute marginal branch. Therefore, our plan here was to do retrograde via septal. If uh, that didn't work, to do undergrade wire escalation, trying to use IVUS for clarifying the origin of the circumflex. And lastly, do retrograde via epicardial if the former approach has failed. This is an EBU uh, 8 French guide catheter. And there is also a catheter, a guide engaged the right coronary artery. We did um, attempts to cross through a septal branch using a Caravel microcatheter as well as a SUO3 and Sion guide wires that was unsuccessful. We did an injection through the septal with microcatheter showing some connection. But unfortunately, despite using multiple guide wires, we were unable to cross through the septal. The wires kept on uh, entering the cavity but not crossing through the collateral. We did some more contrast injections with the microcatheter, but once again, we were unable to advance the retrograde guide wire. Different angles, sometimes the LA of U can help across the septal collaterals, but once again, even in the LA of U, we were not successful. So we failed to cross the septal collateral, and that is why we decided to actually go with retrograde crossing through the epicardial collateral from the first obtuse marginal branch. We inserted the Caravel microcatheter and the SUO or 3 guide wire. As you can see, it's a very tortuous uh, collateral with um, multiple bands, although it wasn't quite as bad as the epicardial coming from the acute marginal from the right. This is once again the SU-03 wire, took the first band, but then it's having quite significant difficulty negotiating this second set of bands. And uh, at some point we switched from a, for a Fielder XTR guide wire. At this time the C on black was not available, that would have been the natural second choice. Unfortunately, the XTR didn't quite follow the course of the vessel, and when we took a picture, we now saw that we have an epicardial collateral perforation with staining around this area. The good news are that the patient did not have previous bypass, which would um, be less likely to cause loculated diffusion. However, the bad news is that epicardial perforations, especially for an epicardial collateral, are tough to treat because one wants to go on both sides and coil or use thrombin of both sides of the perforation, but to treat the side that faces the occluded vessel, one has to recanalize the CTO first 
and at this point we had not recanalized the CTO. So this is challenging because we cannot get access to the collateral from the side that is facing the chronically occluded vessel. Ideally, the treatment is to obtain access from both sides, get a microcatheter from both sides of the perforation, and then either inject thrombin or deploy coils and close the perforation from both sides of the area of the perforation. We did an echo that did not show any effusion. On the positive side, the staining seemed to be fixed. We did a brief attempt for a IVUS guided undergrade puncture. However, although we could uh, locate the proximal cap, which was right in this segment around this area of the vessel, unfortunately, we were not able to make a wire to engage um, to this um, area. Despite using multiple wires, we used also a twin pass dual lumen microcatheter that was, however, unsuccessful. There was continued extravasation. And at this point, we're getting concerned because this is what the pressure was, which is a fairly impressive pulsus paradoxus with 30 millimeter mercury drop in pressure from end expiration to end inspiration. However, when the patient woke up, that paradoxus essentially resolved. And this is an example how deep breathing, such as when a patient is sleeping and snoring, can really cause drop in pressure during inspiration. But this is much less pronounced when the patient takes less pronounced baths. And also what made us more reassured is that we had some similar recordings from the beginning of the case and those were very similar with uh, significant 30 millimeter mercury inspiratory drops in the systolic blood pressure. We decided to stop attempts for crossing. However, the question was how do we seal the perforation? We decided because the perforation was fairly small to reverse the anticoagulation. But before we did that, we removed all the wires and balloons. And after removing them and reversing with protamin, we still kept the guide to the vessel and did an injection and actually the perforation segment was sealed. How can we be 100%? One way is to inject uh, an echo contrast agent such as Definity, which was done here, showing good opacification of the right and left ventricle. And there were no bubbles going into the pericardial space, providing reassurance that the perforation was sealed. So in the end, we failed recanalizing the CTO. However, the patient did have an uncomplicated recovery despite the epicardial perforation. Several lessons. Number one, that epicardial collaterals are riskier than septals. We did injure the septals as well. However, this do not cause problem except very rarely. However, the epicardial collaterals can cause uh, pericardial effusion and tamponade. Number two, if uh, there is uh, an epicardial collateral perforation, treatment may be required from both sides of the perforation, but this is a problem if the CTO vessel has not been recanalized. In cases of small perforations, like in this case, we were able to reverse the coagulation after removing the wires and the microcatheters, and, then, and this actually helped achieve hemostasis. We also saw that uh, there was hemostasis because we gave uh, definite echo contrast and there was no extravasation in the pericardium. And finally, pulsus paradoxus is not a, a absolute uh, indication that there is tamponade. Deep breathing, such as when the patient is sleeping and snoring or taking some deep breaths, can cause pulsus paradoxus. And that is important to differentiate from the pulsus paradoxus caused by tamponade. Thank you very much.